Okay, so um, before you got the mic, you said they may not have actually written these documents. And I think that's right. So we don't have any names on the Gospels until the second century. So if Mark was written around 70, the disciples are all dead by this point. Right? So the, um, the first group of, of the community of faith would have pretty much passed. Remember, life expectancy in the ancient world was not what it is now. Uh, we often think Jesus died so young. Well, actually, he was a good middle-aged Jew at 30, in a sense, in terms of t- lifespan back then. Now, that's, that's tainted a little bit by there was a high mortality rate for children. So if you got through childhood, you might live longer. But still... Um, we can assume that by the time Mark wrote, the original Christians are all gone. Even all of them. Um, So, um, you know, we've got in the book of Acts, I'm not sure how historical to take it, but in chapter 12, Peter basically passes the torch to James, brother of Jesus, already early on. And that's a sign that the first generation has already passed it. Now, a lot of people will talk about Matthew then and Mark as a second generation document. Or Luke and sometimes Matthew as third generations. So we have time removed here. So there's that. Now, the next thing to say though is if you could write, of course you weren't illiterate, right? So, and um, to, but, but you're right that the, the bulk of the population in these days could not read or write. So if you learned to read or write, it most likely meant you came from a family of means. Um, You may have had a slave teach you to write, especially initially on. Maybe family, you could probably be afforded to go to school. Um, So uh, there's one side. The second side is these documents were not written to be read. They were written to be spoken to the community. Most people couldn't read. So they were to be read aloud. So there would be someone who was literate who would read it aloud to the group gathered for worship. So imagine we were here in the early church and I'm the one up reading Mark. In a sense, I'm performing it for you because you can't read, which also gives me some room to interpret it as I go, which is what we assume happened, right? Um, So all that's to say that those who wrote the Gospels were clearly more educated than the common person of the day. Uh, It's also one of the reasons we can be pretty sure almost all of the biblical writers had to be male, even though we don't know that for sure. Because in the ancient day, women just were not, girls and women were not educated as much as men, even in the wealthier families. Um, But let's go back to the apostles for a second. I often think the 12 disciples are misrepresented when we see them as poor common folk who don't have much understanding. So there's a couple of things to remember. First of all, a tax collector had to have some knowledge of accounting and these kinds of things. A tax collector was the ancient mafia, by the way. Because a tax collector was a Jew who took protection money from his own people and then paid off the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire would charge, say, taxes for Houston or this amount of money. And then they would put this Jew in charge of collecting that money for the Romans and then would say, now anything you get in excess of that is yours. So they would collect as much as possible. So they were horrible people. Tax collectors. I mean, at least as the stereotype would go. So when an ancient person hears tax collectors, they go, ugh. Uh, fishermen might be more simple um, for sure. And education was not required. But a fisherman was not someone who went out and caught fish. A fisherman was someone who had a business of selling fish. So often it was a family endeavor. You would uh, have your boats, which cost money. Nets cost money. You were a small business person. You would go out and catch them. Your wife and daughters were usually the ones who salted the fish and cured them and all and sold them. 
often you, um, your shop would have been the first floor of your house and the upper floor was where you lived, just like we talk about those kinds of things now. Um, the, the, the lines between residence and business was very thin in the ancient world. So even though they certainly could have been illiterate, they, they still weren't the poorest of the poor. When we have parables about day laborers, now we're talking about the really poor. Or when we talk about widows or orphans who had no power, no land, no means, that kind of thing. We're talking about the really poor. So in the ancient world, you had this sort of very poor and then a little above that. Daily subsistence, fine, and all that kind of stuff. But then there was no middle class like we think about it. We talk about the waning of the middle class. There was nothing. There was a huge jump to the rich. I mean, this was trickle-down economics, Reaganomics gone awry in the worst of ways. That the separation between those who get by and the really poor and those who have bunches is just extreme. Um, those in the middle might well be able, because people wanted to be nouveau rich if possible. So the best way to do that was to trade. Get on these trade routes and do these kinds of things. So there were all kinds of ways to get money, but you still weren't part of the senatorial class. Or another way to get money was to become a soldier and work up through some ranks. And then you're granted citizenship and land. Things like that. So I want to be careful about, on the one hand, I, I, I want to not over think it, the, the ancient culture in terms of everybody could pick this up and read and make sense of some of the nuances we're going to talk about. But neither do I want to see, especially the authors, as being people who, who weren't theologically astute uh, and literarily astute. Part of the way you would learn to write was to learn to write in the style of the masters. So, for instance, um, one of your assignments would be to write a letter as if you were Plato. And you would learn to sound like Plato and stuff like that. I mean, it was much more rigorous than we think about writing now with these kinds of things. But so if you were trained uh, in, in, in the literate arts, if you will, then you were trained well. Um, and looking at style, we assume of the gospel writers, the three we're talking about, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we assume Luke had the best education. His is the hardest Greek. It's the best style. Matthew then and then Mark is lowest. Um, Mark was not appreciated in the early church um, very much. Matthew was the favorite gospel, quoted the most in the first few centuries. Um, but in the 20th century, Mark has become really popular because it has a lot of sounds that resonate with modern and postmodern kinds of literature. Um, so there's been some literary studies of it. Okay, let's look at this outline real quickly to get us some context. Matthew's gospel begins um, with the birth story and runs through the resurrection. Now, that seems obvious, but Mark and John, for instance, don't have birth narratives, so we need to say that. Um, I especially want to look at some of the markers along the side. Every, there's, the, there's eschatology everywhere, but I just want to show it's from the beginning. So at 123... Um, you know, we quote the scripture, they shall call him Emmanuel, means God with us. We don't think of that eschatologically, but it is. God coming is absolutely an eschatological claim for the ancient world. And then John the Baptist is preaching, repent for the reign of heaven has come near. So all that's before Jesus begins his ministry. And then in 412, Jesus begins his ministry because John is under arrest. So Jesus begins to go out and preach, and he preaches exactly the same message as John. Um, from that time on, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So we get this new message. Now, backing up just a little bit, right before that, to prepare him for it perfectly comes his trial. We often call it the temptation. Again, the better would be better translation is trial. He goes out into the wilderness, an apocalyptic setting. Satan comes, apocalyptic figure, and challenges him to a game of wits, if you will. Right? And for Matthew, the um, big temptation, because each one builds, 
The last temptation is Satan says, I will give you all these kingdoms if you'll just bow down and worship me. Now, notice the implication. Satan assumes he owns those kingdoms and they are his to give. And the Gospel of Matthew agrees. That's the thing to remember. Because kingdom of God is in contrast to the kingdom of Caesar. So Satan owns the kingdoms of the world. Jesus, of course, says no. Um, And then Jesus goes around and begins his ministry. We get the summary of his preaching. And then, unlike Mark, what Mark does is show Jesus' powerful signs as the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He begins healing right away. Matthew begins with Jesus' teaching. So the very first acts of individual ministry we see that aren't just summaries by the narrator is the Sermon on the Mount, the the ethical discourse. And then we get healings um, and and discourses about following Jesus. And then comes the next discourse, the mission one. This is where he sends out the twelve. And what does he tell the twelve to go out and proclaim? The reign of God has come near. It's the same message John the Baptist preached and Jesus has been preaching. Uh, And we already saw in the Lord's Prayer, it's thy kingdom come. This is a theme running throughout Matthew. Um, After that comes the parables discourse in chapter 13. How do all the parables in this chapter begin? That's right. These are eschatological parables. They are not little how to live illustrations. They are talking about the end with a capital E, an eschatological ethic. They're all about the already, not yet. And we're hoping to get there today. Um, Then finally, we get the communal discourse in chapter 18. This is a fascinating discourse that Matthew constructs out of sayings of Jesus and put some of his own stuff in there. And one of the reasons we know Matthew's own hand is in this one is because Jesus talks about the church. There was no church in Jesus' day, ecclesia. So when Jesus says, in the church, dot, 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 we know that Matthew is showing us concerns from his own day. And so... Uh, Part of what goes on in this chapter is to show how the community should behave in in its own dealings with each other and all as an eschatological community. Then we travel to Jerusalem. Jesus turns from Galilee, his home in Capernaum. He's got a house there, uh, which we often think of Jesus as this homeless one. Not in Matthew. In Matthew, Jesus has a house, a headquarters. Um, But then he leaves and goes to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, we get new eschatological signs. The triumph and entry, Palm Sunday, is all eschatological language about the arrival of the Messiah. Um, Then in the temple, Jesus cleanses the temple so he can go in there and teach. And in the temple, he has disputes about who has authority. And what kind, So he one-ups. It's another game of wits. Does it sound familiar? It's, it's, it's a rehearsal, in some ways, of the trials before in terms of asserting the same kind of things. And then finally we get the eschatological discourse. Jesus leaves the temple. And as he, you know, after they've left, the, the, the disciples you know, comment on the temple. And he says, not one stone will be left on the other. When will this happen? We're going to unpack this in detail in a minute. And and he goes off into a long eschatological discourse. Um, Talks about the parousia, a word we're going to talk about in a minute, which is really the second coming. Um, Then we get the crucifixion scene. Matthew has the most fascinating detail at the death that you might not have noticed before. Matthew says when Jesus dies, the temple curtain is ripped in two, like we were just talking about. But also, outside the city, at the cemetery, there's an earthquake. At the very moment Jesus dies, there's an earthquake. Tombs open, and the saints are raised. There is resurrection that occurs at the moment of Jesus' death. 
that is a clear sign that for Matthew, this is an eschatological happening. Because remember, as much as we talk about going to heaven, the early Christians talked about immortal life in terms of resurrection. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 goes to extraordinary lengths to try and make sense of that. So it's all about resurrection. But I love the, the last little part of that detail. The saints are very polite. Because these raised saints, they stay outside the city until after Jesus is raised so they don't one-up his moment. It's a great little marker there. And it's so fascinating because we have this whole apologetic issue later at the resurrection scene where for Matthew you have to put the guards at the temple, I mean at, at the tomb, um, and then they, they see the resurrection but they lie about it and everything. But this little notice about the saints being raised just goes away. It's a radical eschatological moment. And then notice... At the, the resurrection scene, another earthquake. Stone is moved away. Um, so Jesus is gone. And then Jesus gives the Great Commission. And at the end of the commission, well, the first, how does the Great Commission start? Do you remember? All authority on, on earth and in heaven, whichever order it is, has been given to me. How did we start off with Satan right at the beginning of the ministry? I will give you these kingdoms. Now Jesus has taken authority. It is not, I waited to get, I, God has now given it to the crucified and raised Jesus. And then the last word is, and I will be with you always. We started with Emmanuel, God with us. And now we end with God with us. Matthew is very clear that he has told a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. But it is not really the end of the story. The whole book is the beginning of the story, of the eschatological story. So the question is, if, if Jesus' ministry only lasted for a couple of years or so, who are these saints Matthew talks about? And the answer is, we don't have a clue. But it would not have been saints of the church. I mean, I, I think it would have had to be seen as saints of the Jewish faith in some ways. But it's not even clear to us exactly what he means by that word. Um, so the most we can say is it's really clear that he sees this as an eschatological thing, that even the death, through the death we are raised. But beyond that, it's not clear what Matthew thought. I had a question earlier about what is exegesis, because... Um, I've used that line a lot in what I read, and we talk about it at seminary all the time. So let me just say a word about that in relation to this, because that will be helpful. The word is exegesis. So the first time I heard this uh, when I was going to school, I thought, what is this exit Jesus stuff? <laughs> you know, I had no clue what that meant. But exegesis comes from two Greek words, ex, which is like from exit, out, etc., and ago, which means to lead. So exegesis is, is the word we use for interpreting the Bible, which means to lead the meaning out of the Bible. So we try as much as possible to figure out what the original intent of the author was. What was how would the first audience have understood this? What did it mean in its ancient setting as opposed to what it might mean in its current setting? So... Classically, people talked about exegesis moving to interpretation. That language isn't really used much anymore, but it's helpful to show at least that there's a difference between trying to understand the text in its ancient setting and then determining, now based on that, what does it mean for us today? So then and now kind of move. Um, so one of, the, one of the primary methods of exegesis is simply to try and figure out what would have been obvious to the original readers that's no longer obvious to us. So for instance, back where I came from in Lexington, imagine 200 years from now, the, the site has been completely changed and there's an archaeological dig there. And you're in this archaeological dig and you find a reference in a document you got um, from the Dead Sea Scrolls of Lexington, Kentucky. 
that refers to circle four. Okay, so you know some from your studies about numerology, and you know that circle is a symbol of eternity, and you're trying to figure out what's the importance of this. But if you had lived in Lexington in my days, you just simply would have known that was the name of a road. There are lots of things in the biblical text we just simply don't know, but the original readers would have gotten just like that. And we're going to talk about some of those that we've figured out um, over the years and all, but other things we just have to leave and say, I, I don't know what, who those saints were. Now, a contrast, just to throw another term here um, that's often used in the guild. And I, I said I'm going to throw around a bunch of $3 words. But it's called eisegesis. I'm not sure you see it. Instead of E-X-E, it just starts with E-I-S. And it comes from the word in, in Greek, and ago. And um, used to, we would talk about trying to avoid eisegesis, which is putting meaning into the text. So, for instance, uh, one of my professors used to say, the Bible's written on a need-to-know basis. And what that means is you don't have to make up stuff about a biblical text if it doesn't say it. So preachers do this all the time. You can catch your preacher on this. If the preacher says, now what Jesus is feeling here, what Jesus is thinking is so-and-so, and the text doesn't say that, that's eisegesis. We don't know what the character is thinking, the woman, Jesus, whoever. But we preachers like to make up that stuff all the time, which really means that putting us as authorities over Scripture. So the idea is to try and use what's there as opposed to putting, filling in gaps. In truth, though, there is no way to read Scripture or any text objectively. We always bring presuppositions to it. Um, we now even talk about science as not being objective. Sub everything is subjective. Um, used to be people talked about biblical scholarship as a science. We don't have that much hubris anymore. We don't say that anymore. But you still want to try. You can't be fully objective, but you, you want to understand as much as possible in the ancient context as you bring it forward. But there's a great appreciation now for what's called ideological readings. How would you read this text from the position of a woman, from the position of an oppressed community, etc.? Uh, post-colonial readings which say, okay, we're not even going to worry about um, those presuppositions. We're simply going to claim them and acknowledge them and go from them. So biblical scholarship has expanded in so many ways, but this is the basic dichotomy you were asking about earlier. And, and, and the problem, I mean, um, Matthew uses the phrase kingdom of heaven more than any of the other gospel writers. Well, kingdom of heaven certainly because most of these kingdom of God but he uses it more than the others um, so it is absolutely a key concept but that doesn't still clarify what he means by it because darn that Jesus fellow why didn't he just come out and define God's reign wouldn't it have been nice if somewhere in the gospel Jesus said not the kingdom of God is like but just the kingdom of God is and we could put that in Webster's and we'd be settled. But no, he only talked in parables. It's like a mustard seed that grows into a tree. Ah, what does that mean? So very part of the purpose, I believe, is to make us struggle with the concept. Show how important it is, but we're not spoon-fed by this gospel. We're fed, but not spoon-fed. Um, we're going to, we've got that sort of outline. We're going to come back in just a second and turn to uh, Matthew 24 and 25, the eschatological discourse. So we're going to look at the center of the language.